Hello and welcome back to the IEA YouTube channel. I'm Emily Carver. So, how well is Brexit going? It's now been over a year since we signed a comprehensive trade deal with the EU. Five years since the referendum result that shocked much of the British establishment. Since then, it's fair to say we've had a few obstacles thrown in our way. Not least the global pandemic, which has hit the global economy, trade and supply chains significantly. Of course, Brexit was never an end in and of itself. It was always going to be up to the UK government and Brits themselves to take advantage of the opportunities it presents. So, one year on, has it been an utter disaster, as some in the media are claiming? Or are we on the way to making Brexit Britain an international success story? Today, I'll be speaking to Victoria Hewson, an expert on Brexit and, of course, our brilliant head of regulatory affairs, to get her assessment one year on. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching. So, Victoria, thanks for joining me. Hello, nice to see you, Emily. So, firstly, on trade, we know that in the last year there has been a significant reduction in imports and exports to the EU. At the same time, Liz Truss has been rolling over trade agreements with numerous countries around the world and has also pursued deals with the likes of New Zealand and Australia. We're also in talks to join the Trans-Pacific Trade Pact. Simply put, are we making enough progress to make up the shortfall from leaving the EU trade bloc? Well, on trade, international trade, um, it's, it's actually very difficult to make a clear assessment on where we stand because it's very difficult to disentangle the effects from leaving the customs union and single market from the effects of the pandemic, the recession that we suffered as a result, and all of those ancillary effects like the supply chain crunch um, that, that have really had impacts on um, trading goods all around the world. So it's quite, um, it's quite an unclear picture. It was really rather inconsiderate um, of us to have a pandemic coinciding with such an important economic and political event. So it's, it's really not entirely clear how to disentangle the, and disaggregate the, the combined effects. It's certainly fair to say that our trade with the EU um, is down on where it was before we left. Um, our trade with the rest of the world is slightly down still, um, sort of on a on a year year to year basis versus um, pre pre pandemic. But it's recovered more than our trade with the EU, uh, which sort of makes sense because trade with the rest of the world has broadly considered continued on a on a business as usual basis because we always had to deal with trade formalities and essentially tariffs and regulatory barriers and so on with um, non-EU trade partners. And whereas, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the EU, businesses have had to contend with a whole set of new challenges in terms of the, um, the customs and regulatory processes that are now in place. And I think it's probably, however, also fair to say that the disasters that some people had foreseen as a result of that have not unfolded at all. We have not had food shortages despite the, um, you know, the consistent random photographs of empty shelves in supermarkets that, that people on Twitter like to to throw at us to show what a disaster Brexit is. We had plenty of turkey at Christmas. There were pigs and blankets uh, to, be, to be found. Um, so, so none of that really uh, materialised. And that's largely thanks to the tremendous efforts of the um, businesses who import food and other goods from the EU. And also, it has to be said, it doesn't often, uh, it's not often that we at the IEA would praise um, Her Majesty's revenue and customs, but actually the border operating models and the um, sort of facilitations that they put in place to smooth that those uh, new customs processes have really been quite successful in that sense. 
in terms of your um, exact question about making up the shortfall, perhaps of the trade that we will no longer be carrying out with the EU, um, I guess that ties in actually to, to your remaining questions about regulatory opportunities and making the most out of Brexit, because really uh, free trade agreements are not the be all and end all, or they shouldn't be the be all and end all of trade policy. And the best way to trade and make us make a country more um, internationally competitive and more attractive for businesses <clears throat> to uh, to sell their goods and services and also more able to buy better and more competitive goods and services for consumers in this country isn't so much in the pursuit of free trade agreements, although that is a, is a laudable aim and something we should be doing. It's actually by making your domestic settings better and um, making businesses more able to compete and improve their productivity with policies on uh, whether that's tax policies, employment regulations, regulations about goods and services. And so the, the, the trade agenda really does go hand in hand with the domestic reform agenda. Yes, because I mean, does this, um, I've read in The Economist and the FT and also BBC News, they've all reflected on the first year of Brexit and they were looking at the impact on businesses in this country that have had difficulties exporting their goods to the EU, that there have been you know, more forms to fill out, that there have been new regulatory hurdles and so on. Is this something that we can unilaterally change or is this something that will always, will there always be additional hurdles um, with tr for small businesses in this country when it comes to trading with the EU? Or do you see those hurdles being able to be smoothed over? Yeah, that's a great point. And it's so, and it's such an important point. I'm actually working on a briefing uh, related to that at the moment that uh, viewers should should watch out for coming out in a couple of weeks. The, the answer is that we can't do anything really about what the EU requires for the formalities or tariffs or regulatory requirements that it requires for goods entering its market. Uh, that's not quite true. We could agree to all of their demands <laughs> and align with all of their regulations and then they would probably give us some facilitations similar to, say, for example, Switzerland. Uh, but aside, aside from that, uh, we, you, know, you can't force another country to um, make it easier for, for you to export goods to them. But what we can do is make it easier and more efficient for importers in this country to obtain goods and services from other countries, including in the EU. And this is where, in the past year, those sort of facilitations that I was mentioning before, HMRC has made it relatively easy for importers, especially smaller businesses and businesses who haven't really done full-blown international trade before, to get familiar by deferring certain requirements and um, allowing people to, um, to, to post their declarations for their imports after they've already imported the goods and um, and entered them into the market. So there's there's been lots of uh, useful facilitations like that. Now that's broadly coming to an end. A lot of that ended on the 1st of January. And um, there are now, there's an, now basically a full border operating model, certainly for customs and tariffs purposes, is, is now operating. Uh, Touchwood, so far, that seems to not have caused major ructions at the channel ports, etc., which is which is good. But then the other aspect is the is the regulatory aspect, um, where again, thus far, the UK has unilaterally continued to recognise EU regulations and conformity assessment for goods coming onto the UK market, and we're going to continue doing that for about another year, and then. In 2023, currently the government is planning to cease automatic recognition of the EU's CE mark certifying um, goods to enter the market and we'll be launching our own um, UK version of that, which um, I think is not a particularly positive step 
and I think, because I'm going to argue this in the upcoming briefing, is that in the interest of consumers, in the interest of businesses who import intermediate manufacturers, uh, supply chains, we should actually continue to recognise EU conformity assessments and EU goods regulations for entering into our market. Consumers are perfectly happy and confident with EU regulated goods. So there's no practical reason why we shouldn't do that. There are various, I guess, uh, tactical reasons why people think we shouldn't. But um, this is this is the sort of free market, pro-free trade, Ricardian case that that, um, that I'm uh, that I'm making, and that's I guess also um, you know something that would help. We haven't talked about Northern Ireland yet, but that unilateral openness is going to be absolutely essential if we are going to solve the Northern Ireland border and also really to make our trade borders with the rest of the EU as efficient and streamlined as they possibly can be. So when can uh, viewers and our listeners get hold of this briefing paper? Do you have a uh, an idea of when it will be out? Well, I need to consult with our communications department <laughs> <laughs> um, on that, but it will be coming it will be coming out very soon, hopefully before the end of January. Oh brilliant. Okay. That's good to give it a give it a plug on this video. Yeah. That's great. Um, just one last question on trade. Just in terms of international trade, um, how much um, of an opportunity is the Trans-Pacific uh, trade area um, for us to join? Is it likely that we will be joining? Um, how long do such things tend to take? And are our trade deals with Australia and New Zealand significant on their own? Or is this all sort of, you know, small steps to uh, becoming a, uh, a uh, well, a global trading nation again? Yes, the CPTPP, um, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, is a great opportunity for the UK to um, to join this, you know, platform really for trade liberalisation with the other um, countries who are already part of it, and it shows a good level of ambition that we want to do it. The CPTPP, while as you might have gathered, I am somewhat skeptical of the free trade benefits of free trade agreements in general. The CPTPP is, is, is quite a reasonably good one. The Cato Institute, when the US was still proposing to be part of it, did an analysis to try and work out from their perspective whether as a free trade agreement it was net liberalising or not, because sometimes free trade agreements can be used to actually entrench protectionism and corporate interests um, through through some of its provisions. And actually the Cato Institute trade specialists found that the, the TPP was net liberalising and therefore was something they could support as free traders, which I think is, is really interesting. In terms of how long it's going to take, the answer to that is nobody really knows yet because no country so far has, has joined up apart from the originating parties. The, the, the US left it, of course, before it even really started, but no, no country has joined and actually used the accession process. And the accession process, while it is set out in the agreement, it's set out at a very high level. It's basically, you apply to join and you negotiate with the existing members. And if you can reach agreement, they'll let you in. That's, that's you know, very broadly how it works. And, um, you know, it would deliver tariff-free trade with that whole group of countries um, and some, some regulatory gains as well. And so far, the negotiations seem to have been going pretty well. Now, some people think that there's a particularly strong reason for us to join the CPTPP because its regulatory provisions, which commit the UK to um, non-discrimination on technical barriers to trade regulations, food and agriculture regulations. Some people think that if we signed up to that in the TPP, that would actually act as an insurance policy against us signing up to alignment with the EU because the EU um, rules that we would bind ourselves to would actually be in conflict with the commitments in the, in the TPP. Which is, a, which is an interesting question. And without getting too much into the weeds, I don't necessarily think that that's the case, but it certainly shows 
a good level of intention to pursue regulatory liberalisation as well as tariff liberalisation, which is which is a good sign. In, ter- in terms of Australia and New Zealand, Australia, that deal is obviously done. New Zealand, we're expecting that one to be concluded very soon. Again, broadly, it's a good thing to establish tariff free trade with our very close trusted partners like those two countries. Um, a little bit disappointing that, as usual, the farmers had a strong say in agricultural tariffs and they got their protection there to continue for quite a long time. There's a few also slight quirks in the Australia agreement that I don't particularly like around making commitments on um, labour and environmental matters binding and subject to the dispute settlement, which is rather unusual in free trade agreements. These kinds of commitments usually tend to be quite vague um, best endeavours where you can't actually bring any proceedings to enforce them. And so the fact that that's now been included in the Australia deal, um, presumably to try and make it look a bit more um, progressive and a bit more uh, green is is a bit troubling because these things always end up being used in support of uh, protectionist vested interests. So that was probably one to watch. And um, but but apart from that, broadly broadly positive. But I do think we need to we do need to keep a close eye on DID because they are getting quite bogged down in things like. Uh, gender in free trade agreements um, and lots of lots of green stuff and um, I think we need to make sure that we're not being too dazzled by the prospect of lots of new free, free trade agreements and not attending very closely to some of the details that that uh, they're signing us up to. Well it's the same in every uh, department isn't it really this uh, woke politics creeps creeps in yes indeed yeah, creeps into every policy area so moving on to the northern ireland protocol which i uh, think it's fair to say you're our in-house expert on now i i try to get my head around this every time i'm forced to speak on it in one way or another um whether it's on uh, broadcast or just you know in an article or whatever it seems to be one of the most uh, complex and problematic areas to get uh, get your head around when it comes to brexit So, of course, the agreement was crucial to striking the withdrawal agreement uh, that avoided a no-deal Brexit. But since then, it's been hugely costly. Uh, Trade, businesses, consumers have suffered as as a result. Of course, we've had Lord Frost's resignation, which has put a bit of a spanner in the works. The Northern Ireland First Minister, Paul Givan, if that's how you pronounce his name, I saw he came out this week to say that uh, Northern Ireland's power-sharing government will collapse if Boris fails to solve the border protocol. Can you bring us up to date with where we are in terms of the negotiation with the EU on this and uh, whether adequate progress has really been made towards a resolution? Yeah, it's um, it's a really, really tough one. You're absolutely right. The, um, the Northern Ireland protocol, which of course was a protocol to the withdrawal agreement uh, itself, not part of the free trade agreement, the trade and cooperation agreement that was signed last year. Um, However, that doesn't stop the EU using the threat of retaliatory trade sanctions under the TCA as part of its negotiating leverage with respect to the protocol, um, which is slightly disappointing, but entirely predictable, unfortunately. And I would say, you know, again, in, in in general terms, when people talk about, you know, who are the winners and losers of Brexit so far, I would definitely say the uh, consumers and businesses of Northern Ireland have been the, the most significant losers, as well as the British taxpayers who are footing the bill of literally hundreds of millions of pounds in supporting the new systems and processes necessary to implement the protocol, which always makes me quite grumpy when people accused the British government of uh, turning its back on the protocol and not implementing the protocol. We have spent huge amounts of money and effort in implementing the protocol so far and only slightly uh, held back from implementing the parts of it that literally would have cut off food and medicine supplies to Northern Ireland. So I think people do sometimes get a little bit carried away with 
accusing the British government of um, walking away from its treaty commitments there. So uh, where does it stand? Well, obviously, the UK in the past year also did make some unilateral decisions um, to extend the so-called grace periods that the EU had originally agreed to on regulatory requirements, especially for food and medicines. And ultimately, the EU then accepted those unilateral measures and put forward some suggestions for how the requirements for um, customs declarations and regulatory checks, and and not just checks, it's also regulations as to what is allowed on the Northern Ireland market per se. Right, so it doesn't even, it's no use in, in checking your goods if the checks will reveal that they don't meet EU rules and they're not allowed in. So I always feel like the checks narrative is slightly missing the point that the real problem is the underlying regulations that that pertain if they effectively ban food and other goods from Great Britain being imported into Northern Ireland. And so the the British government put forward a, um, a command paper setting out it our um, the UK's position on um, amending the protocol, which was really almost like completely re- rewriting it to get rid of that trade border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, so there would be no need for customs declarations anymore, and so that goods from Great Britain would automatically be permitted on the market in Northern Ireland. The EU obviously wasn't very delighted about that at all, and they counter proposed some measures towards the back end of last year, um, which were press released by them with great fanfare that this will uh, eliminate most checks and you know s- secure food and medicine supplies. But in the substance of the proposals, it didn't really uh, show any substantive measures that that would actually achieve that. So it wasn't really clear where they were getting these these headline claims from, and most. Crucially, from our perspective of UK regulatory autonomy and reform, I'm afraid much of the EU's proposals were tied to the UK as usual, uh, aligning to EU rules in order to allow Great Britain goods into Northern Ireland. So we were sort of back to where we were really back to the beginning. And obviously Lord Frost, was negotiating rather firmly um, on that. And there was rumours swirling for for quite some time that the UK would be invoking the famous Article 16 of the protocol, which allows either party to suspend certain provisions of the protocol if they are causing economic or societal uh, disturbances. And of course, the argument is that oh and or diversion of trade is the other uh trigger point and the argument is and i think this is a pretty strong argument that there's been huge diversion of trade because instead of being able to continue to use their normal supplies of goods into northern ireland businesses consumers in northern ireland have been diverted to obtaining goods from the republic of ireland that's diversion of trade it's definitely happening so the uk's position is that the criteria for Article 16 and therefore suspending these parts of the protocol that give rise to the trade border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland could be suspended while we try and work out with the EU how to fix it for the long term. The other uh, factor that gives rise to the conditions for triggering Article 16 are the social and political disturbances that it's causing in Northern Ireland, the unionist uh, politicians and uh, unionist community are feeling very aggrieved about the protocol, uh, that it has undermined their position in the United Kingdom. A court last year um, actually found that the government had, in effect, repealed the Act of Union by passing the protocol in, and implemented it into law. And if you're a unionist and you signed up and worked around the Belfast Agreement these past uh, 10 years and more, you, you, I think it's quite understandable that you'd be somewhat aggrieved 
that um, the government has somehow um, managed to repeal the Act of Union without even telling anyone about it. So that's all, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of disorder, threats and um, suggestions that the power sharing arrangement in Northern Ireland that you alluded to is not going to survive. So I feel like the pressure is really on those trusts to deliver a sustainable mm. solution, but it's no clearer to me now than it was in the course of last year what that sustainable solution is going to look like unless the UK uh, takes some unilateral steps and potentially has to absorb any uh, retaliations that the EU then throws at us as a result of that, which, you know, nobody wants to trade for. Um, and I'm certainly not trying to be going ho about the risk of um, tariffs being imposed and new unnecessary trade barriers arising. Um, but it's very hard to see how the EU can equally claim from its side that it's respecting its commitment to protect the peace process and uh, stability in Northern Ireland with its current stance. Just uh, just one question on, on the Northern Ireland Protocol. How damaging do you think it actually has been that Lord Frost has resigned? Um, you said that he was, you know, a hard negotiator. He was willing to take a tough line. He was willing to threaten um, Article 16 um, and so on. Is it a real, is it... <laughs> How big of a deal is it that he has now resigned? And do you have confidence that Liz Truss is the woman to uh, take us forward with this? Does she have the expertise? Does she have the nous? Does she have the attitude that can mimic or do even do better than uh, Lord Frost was already doing? How much of a concern do you think that is for government and, and for you as someone who's watching it closely? Yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting that when Lord Frost um, resigned, the... Uh, that that news was received with great joy uh, amongst um, uh, EU commentators and also the more uh, Remainerish commentators in the UK. He'd made himself really unpopular, which you know, from my personal perspective, as, as someone who had supported Brexit, uh, I thought really um, mm. to me that suggested he was annoying all the right people. Yeah, and and the reason that the the, the EU side detested him so much was because he was actually um, standing up to them and negotiating quite astutely in ways that arguably his predecessors and the Theresa May had, had failed to do, which made him rather unpopular in uh, Brussels and Dublin. Um, and then there was some suggestion shortly before he resigned that some senior officials uh, within government were, were briefing against him and making some noises about how there was no way we were going to be triggering Article 16, which was interpreted in some quarters as perhaps signs of his position, his negotiating, or Frost's negotiating position being undermined either for, by senior officials within the civil service or by forces um, operating against him within government. I'm not too sure that I buy that. I think that story was somewhat overblown. And I'm also not entirely convinced that the the, um, the the haters in Brussels are going to get on too much better with Liz Truss, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I, but I think po probably the main risk with Truss taking over is um, is whether she is going to have the bandwidth to get across the level of detail um, that we're that we're talking about here in the sort of um, my, uh, I guess what, what my old boss Shankar Singham would have called the, the, the four-dimensional chess game uh, because Truss is obviously foreign secretary which is a very um, very full-blown cabinet role in and of itself. She still has the equalities brief um, yeah. that, that she is responsible for so throwing this in there as well um, is, is a rather ambitious undertaking um, for her to be able to fully commit to you in the way that obviously Lord Frost was able to do as that was his main full-time job. Yes, it's quite extraordinary that they've thrown this role into the mix. Um, I mean, Liz Truss is uh, not shy of hard work, but those three roles altogether, although perhaps that means that she'll uh, 
drop the uh, women's inequalities or at least let it go down her priority list which uh, we know well, bad thing in my view perhaps perhaps if we were to just disband the uh, government equalities office and get rid of the equalities brief that would actually be a very welcome deregulatory move by a government well there you go perhaps we could uh, ask Liz Truss to do that send her a letter um, so, moving on to EU rules and regulations, um, you can keep your answer quite brief. I know I've kept you for a, for a while now. Um, of course, this was one of the areas um, free market Brexiteers were particularly excited about. They thought this would be the moment we could axe all those pointless EU laws and regulations um, that we, you know, that we all had to uh, deal with, that businesses had to cope with. Um, in his New Year's message, Boris Johnson highlighted a couple of what he saw as key successes of Brexit this year, hopefully he was uh, just being, hopefully they were just gaffes more than anything, because he said two of the most important things were um, returning crown stamps to pint glasses and scrapping a ban on selling goods in pounds and ounces. Hardly groundbreaking, I would I would say, but um, of course many have mocked this, but is this really where we're at? Has the UK made any serious progress in making the most of our regulatory freedoms? Or is it too soon? Are we being harsh by saying that they haven't gone through every regulation with a fine tooth comb? Um, or do we really need to be getting on with it by now? Yeah, I think it's it's certainly true to say there has been some progress in some fields. The weights and measures thing, uh, I can't really get excited about. I, I'll get quite excited if Paul Roger bring out an imperial pint of champagne um, and maybe we'll get some in the office for, for, for a small party to, to celebrate that, I if, like that. If, if that happens. Um, but it's, I guess that's the kind of thing that, you know, the press picks up on and gets rather excited about, but it's not that interesting. On the other hand, uh, it is actually a liberalising step because, you know, manufacturers and consumers should be able to sell champagne by the pint if they want to. Um, it's, it shouldn't be compulsory, you know, I think a lot of people who were mocking it were, were getting a bit, seem to assume that it would somehow be compulsory to sell uh, in pounds and ounces and, and imperial pint, which I, it, it, it slightly misses the point. This is a liberalising measure to allow the market to decide um, how they want to sell, uh, sell goods. And um, otherwise, you know, there has been some small glimmers of hope there was some interesting uh, commentary about some changes to the UK listing rules that seem to have had a positive effect in the city so far. And actually, the city has has been, you know, mergers and acquisitions activity uh, has been has been very busy this past twelve months. Although that might have more to do with um, stimulus um, and in the US and and might potentially not be entirely sustainable, but you know the listing rules reforms is, is a good thing the government has consulted on reforms to the, the gdpr which to my mind were a bit um half-hearted well not half-hearted but that's not fair but they were very much just sort of making chipping away at small changes around the edges rather than diving in for a full written branch review of what data protection should really be about what we mean by privacy they, 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 they swerved that, um, you know, partly for political reasons that a lot of people really love the GDPR in this country, and also partly because you don't want to, they don't want to risk getting too far away from the EU in case we lose our adequacy. Um, and that's going to be a recurring theme, I feel, as we start moving through the other parts of, say, financial services regulation. So it's been patchy, and I think to your point what's really disappointed me is that so far there hasn't really been that um very systematic review of the the retained eu law that we took on um it's been it's been a piecemeal process and hopefully depending on where the the brexit opportunities portfolio lands because i don't think that's going to the foreign office uh that would seem to be uh, a, an unlikely prospect that trust will take on that. Um, but I would very much like to see that systematic review of the, the body of EU law really kick off in earnest in the coming year. And of course, at the same time, the government seemed 
adamant or transfixed on uh, making up new regulations, which of course you're looking yes, at I, the online world. Exactly. It's been a it's been very much a real world action actually from my perspective in, in regulatory affairs here. I was, you know, set up we set up the program to be very forward looking, seizing the opportunity with Brexit, Britain Unlimited. And actually it's just been a constant rear guard action against all manner of craziness. So um hopefully that will also uh start to shift in the new year. We can hope. We can hope. Now uh we'll finish up shortly, but I just wanted to uh get a quick score from you on these three fronts. So on trade, the Northern Ireland Protocol and axing EU rules and regulations, just to get a sort of score out of five on how well we're doing, considering we've had a pandemic and considering that, you know, we're only uh, one year on from the uh, trade deal being uh, signed uh, with the EU. How do you think we're going out of five on trade? So I'm trying, I'm going to be quite generous and, and give a, a, a four out of five. I'd still like to see more unilateral liberalisation, but the, the, the direction of travel is reasonably positive. Good stuff, good on trade. And on the Northern Ireland Protocol? Um, I'm going to say 2.5. Um, the, the, the very fact and existence of the protocol still causes me great pain. Um, so I can't be too positive about it. But I think the government has probably tactically done um, it, it's it's tread a very careful path and um, has has potentially laid the groundwork for some improvements. And lastly, how well do you think the government's done in terms of progress on uh, rules and regulations? Yeah, that's going to be um, I'm going to give that a two. Um, definitely losing points for adding new rules and regulations um but you know some some reasonable efforts have also been made in a few fields like um common agricultural policy reforms so so it's not nothing but it, it definitely could do better okay so that's a four on trade a 2.5 on the nip and a two on regulation so finally just one quick question before we finish um what would you change if you were you know, in charge of the entirety of the government and Brexit and everything, what would you be doing to make the most of this opportunity to uh, prove the naysayers wrong and show that Brexit could be and is, you know, a fantastic opportunity going forward? I think I would definitely stress this need to have um, the full systematic review of EU regulations and really make uh, a qualitative case for why some or most of them can be reformed or removed and in a, in a way that doesn't get brought down in too much um, sort of political triangulation and trying not to offend anyone and trying to say oh well we don't want to deregulate we just want to regulate better you know let's 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 be bold and and admit that we do want to deregulate there's too much regulation it, it often doesn't achieve what it set out to achieve in terms of consumer protection or or safety or innovation or any of these things and let's have a real good quality to look and really make the case for a lighter regulatory burden well there we go that's the uh, brexit wish for 2022 from victoria anyway um to deregulate and not be shy about it um, thanks, Victoria, for joining me. That was really, really interesting just to do a quick look at everything that's been going on in terms of Brexit. All we've been talking about really is the pandemic. So it's nice to uh, look at Brexit with uh, fresh eyes. Light relief. <laughs> Some light relief. Yeah, it used to be the uh, equivalent of the pandemic, didn't it, Brexit? But anyway, um, thanks so much for joining us and thanks to our viewers for listening or watching. Um, uh, please do give this video a like and subscribe to our channel and also leave a comment letting us know what else you'd like to hear discussed. Thanks for joining me.